by the mic. I'm going to hold the microphone closer. I'm a statistician by trade. I guess I've been for 40 years, so I can just say I'm a statistician. But I'm telling you, there's about a 40% chance I'm just going to cry and choke up, and you're not going to get anything from me tonight. <laughs> so I'm not joking. <laughs> so just, you'll, you'll tell when I quit talking that I'm going to choke up. <clears throat> so, excuse me. And uh, I've been coughing all day, too. So uh, my name is Greg, and there's Stephanie there, and she married Matt. Anyway, I, I um, thought about what I wanted to say two months ago, and every night going to bed, I would think about what I wanted to say. So I close my eyes, imagine myself here in this beautiful venue, which we've seen before, sans flowers. But now that here, it's you know beautiful, and everything is beautiful. And I just thought about Stephanie and how much she loves flowers and dainty things and fairies and. She always has, and she might be embarrassed for me to tell people that you like fairies. No, I don't. She, she's not all in on fairies. So I started thinking about fantasy, and I thought, what does that have to do with marriage and weddings? Nothing. It's a dichotomy, that's what it is. And so I really wanted to start the talk. I'm talking about dichotomies because I like them. As a statistician, I like to know the data distribution and the extremes. <laughs> and dichotomies are, and so I started thinking about fantasy versus reality. And uh, my daughter is sort of like the fantasy in a wedding is like a fantasy in a way. It's glitz and glamour and food that you never eat hardly much. And and Stephanie probably won't be wearing that dress too much more. <laughs> well, she might. She might just she might just wear that every day. Yeah, every Saturday. But but I started thinking about fairies and why she liked them so much. It's not the wings and the magic. It's just they're always wearing pretty dresses. They're these gorgeous flower-clad dresses, and so she used to get books on fairies and then look at those, and I would approve them in the bookstore. Yes, that's okay. Those fairies are not grown-up fairies; they're little fairies. <laughs> and, and then she started collecting books in general, but she also started making fairies. So let me see if I can. Can you help him, please? So um, I was looking through my stuff in my office and ran across this envelope from my mother to me. He said, this was made by Stephanie Ginn, in case I forgot her last name, <laughs> and given to Papa. He treasured it. See that Stephanie gets it. So this was one of her little fairy creations. It's oh. like a little, oh. see now you choked up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so she made like a truckload of these fairies. Her room became like a fairy factory. She would go to Michael's, come back with a bag of flowers, and then the cloud of sparkle dust would leave her room, and there'd be just a floor full of fairies. But they're not really fairies, they're just little ladies wearing flower dresses. And then Stephanie learned to draw, and she draws with passion. If you've ever seen her work, it's just mind boggling. But they always contain little ladies with flowery dresses. So um, let me fast forward to when Stephanie went wedding dress shopping. And this was a few months ago, I don't know when, but I only heard the story secondhand because Renee came back to work out. We were staying in Raleigh and she said, Stephanie found a wedding dress. And, oh, fantastic. She show me pictures. She said, first let me show you the dresses she didn't pay. <laughs> so she showed me these <laughs> wedding dresses. I was going, those are great. Those are pretty nice. She looks great. And apparently that's what everybody said when she tried them on. Those were great, those great. So they shopped at that one place, went to the next wedding dress store, and uh, the lady there helped them. I don't know what the official name of the wedding dress salesperson is, but they went through that same routine. Yeah, great, long, let's go find that lady was a little more clever and said, let me see your Pinterest board. Apparently that's a thing, <laughs> right? Women know about Pinterest board, so she showed them then the lady said, I know what you want. So she goes back and comes out with that thing right there. <laughs> <laughs> and Stephanie comes out with it, wearing it. And then I hear Stephanie kind of tears up a little bit. And then the bridesmaids and stuff was there, and Renee was there. And everybody's kind of tearing up a little bit. Glad I wasn't there. And <laughs> then the wedding dress lady said, I did, so I think you found your wedding dress, right? So um, that is how she found Readiness. So then let's fast forward a few more weeks when we were showing our friends Carl and Amy here pictures of the wedding dress. And the first thing Carl says was, that looks like those little figures, ladies that Stephanie 
is drop. And I don't know why I choked up over little ladies, but <laughs> that's what gets me when I practice this speech. Is I first practiced it with a lady who was cutting my hair. And I said, she found out my daughter was getting married, and I said, you want to hear what I'm going to say? She said, yeah. So I started telling her, and she said, no, oh, and I got to the part about the little drawing that's matching her wedding dress and choked up. With the Parker lady. <laughs> <laughs> I made it through this thing, so that was good. And what, what does that mean? It means that Stephanie has a style. And when I first saw that wedding dress, Renee held it up on her phone. She said, Here's the dress Stephanie picked up. I said, That looks like Stephanie. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what that means, you know, dress looking like a dog, but she has a style of uh, certain things she likes, and it's whimsical and fantastical. And what does that mean for marriage? Here comes, as Renee calls, the boring part. <laughs> <laughs> and my cousin Jeff is here, and he's preached about a thousand sermons in his life, and they all have alliterations. And I wasn't planning on this, but I was thinking that well, marriage does two things. It creates families, and it connects families. So, first of all, I Googled what is a family, because I, I didn't know exactly. And it says people connected by birth, marriage, or adoption. So I thought we should just adopt Matt. <laughs> the Hudson's didn't want to part with him, and Stephanie had, didn't want nothing to do with that. So anyway, that, so yeah, marriage was the main thing. So it creates a family, it creates a little union. So two different people come together to create one thing, and it's a family. And it's, it's kind of intersecting, and it's, it's inseparable, it's a, it's a unit. And the other thing it does, it connects families. Now, the Gins and Hudson. And all people that are connected to the Hudsons are connected to the Gins and all of their peoples. And it's just a whole big family tree. And it all comes together because these two made the decision to create this family called the, the newest mistress, the Hudsons. Anyway, so if families are important, and they are, <clears throat> that brings me to my favorite definition of the word love. Because I think love is an important part of marriage. So I mean, you could say all kinds of things. I'll tell you this one quick story. When we met with our there's when we met with our pastor the first time, our pastor said, Okay, Greg, what's the most important part of marriage? And we yelled at him, um, commitment, because that's what we thought it was. And he said, No, that's that's wrong. It's it's Jesus. <laughs> I mean, Jesus. I'm gonna say Jesus. <laughs> but anyway, I think love, if you define it the way I define it, is really kind of key. And here's my issue with love. It has so many needs, right? Like, I love pocket knives. I do. I, I don't want to like marry pocket knives. And, and the, so my favorite definition came from a book I read once called Concentric Circles of Concern. And the, um, the definition was love is meeting needs. So if you meet someone's needs, you're loving that person. Well, I keep that definition floating in my mind my whole life. I learned that definition in 1980. Four. So that's a long time ago, before Matt was born, probably. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I'm still <laughs> So, but nonetheless, when Matt came to the house, and every time I saw Matt, in my mind, I've got a little checkbox. So is he meeting Stephanie's needs? And doggone, he did over and over again. I can't even repeat them because I showed up, but I just did checkbox after checkbox of Matt loving Stephanie the way I Define love, which means you gotta have all the romance, you gotta have the passion and all those kind of things, but they kind of fall a little bit short. I could tell another story about cousin Jeff and, and how he chose his wife and, and all, and it stuck with me my whole life about uh, love. And I know this in the Greek, there's about eight words for love, at least, you know, and we have one in English, and it just has to suffice for, suffice for everything. But if you keep that love speaking needs, and, I'm going to remind you that periodically, I do think you will be in good shape. Um, and there's one last thing I'll say. Stephanie came to me one time and said, Dad, you know that advice you always gave us about expectations? I said, yeah, yeah. She said, it's terrible advice. No. <laughs> it's absolutely horrible. And I said, no, I've changed my mind on that anyway. I just never told you. But I used to say, what? Well, I just, I mean, got around to it. But, you know, I used to say something like, if you lower your expectations some, and there's good reasons to lower your expectations, um, because then you'll never be disappointed. What a miserable existence. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> the best thing can happen to you, somebody doesn't step on you or something. 
<laughs> is not the way to be. So I've changed my mind on that. But I mentioned that just the other day to our cousins Rita and, and uh, Tracy. You did it our way. <laughs> yeah, I, did. I was video saying the word expectation. But they said it had a different meaning back then, and they liked it. I, I must have come across differently. <laughs> The main thing I was trying to protect was having these feelings. Like when we watch a movie, I would know that somebody's about to die in this movie, and I would tell the kids, don't get too attached to that person. <laughs> they would know right off the bat, okay, that person's going to die. Thanks, Dad. And they stopped watching the movie. <laughs> yeah, even you know, my younger son Andrew won't watch it anyway, because he would talk the whole time. <laughs> anyway, so it's not lowering expectations, really, but I learned today from. Carl, he gave me this little quote. Expectation is resentment and waiting. So if you do set expectations, and we all do, and the people don't meet that, especially the spouse, then resentment is just waiting right there. It's like, you know, we had friends who got married, and they told me, I don't think my wife loves me. Like, what are you talking about? Well, she doesn't turn out the lights when she leaves the room. Like, Bobby, I don't think that's the definition of love. <laughs> Maybe in Arkansas, when we grew up, it was. But we moved on since then. <laughs> Past the light switch. But everybody has their own level of expectations. And so, but my new advice is go ahead and set your expectations high. Aim for the moon. Seek the best goals you can. Climb the best routes and climbing gyms you can. But prepare or plan or allow for the possibility of that expectation not being met. Don't let it be a resentment just waiting to happen there. Okay, this is the very last thing I'm going to say. <laughs> I read another book, and it was in, whatever, 84. So every, I think you've read it, it's in 84. It was a good year of books. <laughs> and it's this, it's, it's The Road Less Traveled. How you have read that book? And the first line in the book is like this. It says, life is difficult. And then I don't know the exact quote, but after that it goes on to say, but once you know that life is difficult, it actually becomes easy. And here's why. And you can substitute marriage for life. You can say marriage is difficult, but once you realize marriage is difficult, it becomes easy. And it's this, because the fact that marriage is difficult just no longer matters. It's just part of marriage. It's difficult. And it says, well, it said life is difficult, but remember, I'm substituting marriage here. So marriage is really just a series of problems waiting to be solved. Steph and Matt climb in the climbing gym, each of their roots that they're climbing are called problems. That's, I think that's interesting. What? Problems? Thumbs up. Problems is correct. In my limited climbing experience. And so they will each approach those problems a different way. Matt has superior strength and, and what do you call it? You can reach further. Reachability. <laughs> and Stephanie has um, flexibility probably. And she has to think of other ways to solve that climbing problem. But basically, it's solving problems. And so is marriage. It's, it's solving problems that will inevitably come because another thing I read one time, this is probably in the 90s, it was said that conflict is inevitable in every relationship. Conflict will come. If you think it's not going to, then you're fooling yourself. The trick is don't let the conflict just continue to escalate. Yeah. And when it comes, deal with it, take it, accept it, and then move on. And I've seen Matt Seven do that already in their tiny little squabbles that I've seen them have. They communicate well, and that's important. And I believe that's it. So just remember everything I said. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>